Wow. What a happy surprise. <laughs> Matt's back, Brad's here, and James. And you're here. Happy Monday, everyone. Seriously, welcome to the State Department. Just a few things at the top. I couldn't resist, so. Uh, great. Let's start with Nairobi, uh, where today, this morning, Secretary Kerry announced um, new U.S. government funding, rather, of nearly $29 million for the Office of the United States, or United Nations, High Commissioner for Refugees, efforts to focus on voluntary uh, refugee return uh, to Somalia. He also announced an additional $117 million for refugees and drought victims in Kenya and Somalia. He also uh, uh, announced nearly $138 million in U.S. humanitarian assistance to South Sudan. And that includes funds for food aid, safe drinking water, and emergency health services to U.N. and NGO partners in South Sudan. Uh, tomorrow, the Secretary will be in Nigeria. Uh, we'll have more for you then. He also, of course, met with uh, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, where they discussed uh, Kenya's upcoming uh, 2017 elections, regional security issues, uh, the refugee situation in Kenya, and the importance of adhering to international law in countering violent extremism. Uh, I do, just before turning to your questions, want to note our sadness upon learning earlier today of the death of former, the former President of Singapore, uh, S.R. Nathan, earlier today. President Nathan was a lifelong civil servant whose career spanned all five decades of the U.S.-Singapore relationship, including six years as Singapore's uh, ambassador to the United States and 12 as its president. Uh, we extend our deepest condolences to, the president, uh, to President Nathan's family and uh, to the people of Singapore. And uh, I'll start with you, Matt. All right. Um, thanks. So long. I, I, I heard I missed a lot last week, so I don't <laughs> know, really know where to begin. <laughs> Apparently, your colleague had some fun up here on Thursday. Uh, but, but fun. Let's, well, I'm yeah, just perhaps not fun. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps fun is not the right word for it, but I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, let's just start with Iran. Of course. Um, and uh, the uh, apparent ending of the missions that they've been fly uh, that Russia has been flying out of uh, out of the West, and the what appears to be some kind of anger um, or annoyance from the Iranian side with the Russians. One, uh, are you sure, and in your, your contacts with the Russians as it relates to the ceasefire talks and all that kind of thing, that, that, this, that this is over, that this operation of them flying uh, sorties from Western Iran into Syria mm -hmm. is over? Do you know? Um, what do you make of the apparent Iranian annoyance that the Russians announced this? Uh, we'll start there. Well, honestly, Matt, and I know uh, Secretary Kerry spoke uh, briefly to this uh, during his press avail earlier today. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, – uh, I mean, I'd have to refer you, frankly, to the governments of Russia and uh, Iran to speak to what happened. Um, you know, we're monitoring it closely. We continue to. Uh, it's not clear to us, uh, other than what we've seen in various press and public statements, whether uh, – their use of this air base has uh, definitively stopped, but we'll continue to watch it closely. Um, you know, to us, it's part of a larger picture that is alarming uh, coming out of Syria, uh, where we've seen uh, continuing airstrikes in and around Aleppo, uh, whether they're coming from Russia's uh, bases in Syria itself, whether they're coming from air bases it's using in Iran, or whether it's coming from other places, uh, it's still uh, only making what is already a difficult situation much worse. So, okay, so there haven't been any conversations that, that you're aware not of? Not that I'm aware of. He hasn't spoken with Lavrov today. No. He, he hasn't. But not even at the at the lower level, like the Geneva-type level where the I'm, – I'm not aware that we have a, a <coughs> confirmation one way or the other what's, what's going on here. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say the word – I don't want to use the word clueless, but – But you just did. <laughs> I, well, I said I didn't want to use it. <laughs> So how would you how would you how would you assess I mean, I mean, your current understanding of the situation? So Matt, I mean, a couple of points to make here. One is, you know, um, I'm not going to necessarily speak or address from this podium what we may know through intelligence channels. Um, uh, you know, I know our colleagues over at the Pentagon are obviously watching uh, this very closely. 
I guess my major point here is, uh, you know, while we noted its significance uh, last week, it doesn't really change the calculus. We know that Iran is supporting the regime and working with Russia to do so. Um, we're, so does that sure. apply to also the – it has not changed. You don't believe that, the, that these flights have changed the calculus on the ground in wherever it is they're bombing? In, in, in terms of uh, – In terms of the, 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 the state of play on the battlefield. Well, only in that, like I said, you know, I mean, you know, the images coming out of Aleppo last week were, to put it mildly, heartbreaking. Uh, and, uh, you know, further strikes that are clearly uh, not just hitting exclusively Nusra and uh, ISIL targets, but are clearly hitting civilian targets as well are not helpful. All right. Last one. Yeah, my sure. last one on Iran, Russia. And that is, have you seen the um, reports that um, Ru the Russians are now negotiating the sale of uh, fighter planes? Uh, with Iran? I have not, Matt. I'll take those okay. questions. And then what yeah, tied ahead. to that is also, did you guys ever decide or make a determination on the S-300 and the system and whether or not that um, was a destabilizing I'm, I'm not aware we system? have, Matt. Uh, uh, and it's been a while. I, I, I'm aware that it's been a while, but I'm not aware we have. Let me let me take that as well. Okay. Let me get, let me get our shot, and then I swear I'll go to you. Say. I'd like to deal with the um, the judge's decision today with regard to the 14,900 additional okay. documents um, that uh, the State Department has been ordered to uh, appraise, review, uh, and then to attend a hearing in a month uh, when you're going to get a schedule for their production. Um, so question one is, do you believe that you will be able to appraise all of the documents within the month that the court has given you? Question two is, um, do you have any uh, estimate of how quickly you will be able to review and, if necessary, redact uh, the documents um, so that they can be publicly released? So um, just to confirm, because we've had a lot of incoming on this uh, this morning, as you can imagine, so we can confirm. Uh, uh, that the FBI material that was handed over to us uh, includes approximately 14,900 documents uh, reflecting both uh, non-record, which is a bureaucratic way to say personal, uh, and record materials, which is a bureaucratic way to say work-related, uh, uh, that will, uh, as you noted, have to be appraised now by uh, our folks here at State Department. Um, what I can say uh, at this point in time is that there will be a, a status conference uh, with the court on September 23rd uh, that will discuss the production schedule. And as I, I think I noted last week, we've already committed, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, voluntary, voluntarily agreed, in fact, to uh, produce to just Judicial Watch uh, uh, any email sent or received by Secretary Clinton in her official capacity, and that includes within, or rather that within the material rather, uh, that was turned over by the FBI, and which were not already processed by through our FOIA uh, process. So, um, your question was, how soon do you think we can conduct the appraisal? Can you, can you conduct yeah. The appraisal so I think the the, the intent is sorry. I'm going to talk over you. I think the um, the intent is to do that appraisal before September 23rd, and during that, and that on 20, 23rd of September, uh, lay out or uh, discuss with the court, obviously, uh, a production schedule. Um, but again, we're still in the process of uh, looking at uh, the amount of effort, the amount of resources we need to commit to doing that. But okay. that's the intent, at least. And yeah. do you uh – to go back to what you just said about your voluntary agreement to produce any emails to or from Secretary Clinton, um, did you mean to say any emails or did you mean to say any work related work related yeah. emails? Okay, yeah. um, and that's always been a obviously a yeah. point a dividing line or whatever. Uh, so, um, what do you have a clear understanding of why work related emails would have turned up? in the FBI investigation, but not have been, and to be more precise, work-related and record in the federal, uh, in the, you know, according to the federal rules on what is a record, why 
uh, work-related emails, federal records, would have turned up in the FBI's investigation, but would not have been turned over by Secretary, former Secretary Clinton's uh, staff uh, in uh, the first place. So uh, a couple of uh, points to make there. Uh, first of all is, since we haven't had a, uh, the opportunity yet to make a, a full assessment, and frankly, even begin our assessment, uh, and complete a review of the documents uh, uh, to determine uh, which were work-related, which were uh, personal. We still don't know. We still don't have a firm sense of how many of these 14,900 are new uh, that we haven't seen before. Granted, that's a healthy number there, so there's likely to be uh, quite a few. Um, in response to your your, what I think is your question, though, which is why didn't we have these earlier? Uh, um, all I can say is what former Secretary Clinton has said, which is that, you know, uh, she said that she confirmed for the court that she had handed over or believed that she had handed over all of the work-related emails uh, that were contained on ClintonEmail.com that were in her custody um, that she believed were potentially uh, federal records. Uh, and she provided all of those, uh, as I said, that were in her possession uh, to the department. Um, the FBI, uh, obviously, in the course of its investigation, seems to have found other documents. Um, I'm not sure it's referred to the FBI to speak to where they obtained these uh, records from. Um, but I think right now our uh, focus is to move forward with our assessment of these, appraisal of these documents and then figure out how soon we can get them uh, over to Di Judicial Watch. But it, the, it, if the 14,900 documents mm -hmm. include even one work-related federal record, as you say is most likely to be the case, why sh should you not have had those already? Well, again, I, I, I think that's something that we're looking at internally. Um, uh, and all I can do is, is refer you to what I just said, which is that, you know, Secretary Clinton, uh, as she verified herself uh, uh, to the court, uh, said that she gave to the, over to the State Department all of her work-related emails that were on her server. And one, one other one on this. Um, uh, Judicial Watch has released a number of emails, including some not to or from Secretary Clinton. I mean, some are, but including emails between um, Doug Band, who at the time was either, I think, an aide to former President Bill Clinton or was working for the, the and or was working for the Clinton Foundation, um, in which they show uh, requests, which I mentioned are not unusual, but requests for meetings with then Secretary Clinton by senior officials, uh, senior foreign officials. Um, to your, to directly to Secretary Clinton's emails? These, some of them were two, but most of them, the ones I'm referring to are, were between Band and Omar Abedin okay. regarding requests and the specific one by the Crown Prince, I think, of Bahrain asking mm -hmm. to see um, then Secretary uh, Clinton. Um, to your knowledge, was there any policy on the part of former Secretary Clinton to exclude from her work-related, her emails deemed to be federal records, emails that dealt with the Clinton Foundation? The, I'm sorry, the, this is the last part of your question. Was there any effort, time. was there a decision by then Secretary Clinton, by, by former Secretary Clinton's okay. aides to sorry. exclude from federal records emails to or from the Clinton Foundation? Certainly that I'm not aware of. Um, Sorry, certainly that, the, not, the, that the, 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 not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, what I would say about those emails is, uh, more generally, is that you know, uh, State Department officials, uh, including Ms. Abedin, uh, are in touch with a full range or a wide range of uh, outside individuals and organizations, uh, nonprofits, NGOs, uh, think tanks, others. Um, and requests for meetings with the secretary come from a broad uh, uh, range of sources um, and through different channels, both formal and informal. That's to be expected. Uh, 
there was nothing precluding uh, State Department officials uh, from having contact with, in this respect, with Clinton Foundation staff. Um, and I would just add to that that the department's actions uh, under Secretary Clinton uh, were always taken with the, the intent to uh, advance uh, our foreign policy interests uh, uh, as set forth by this administration and with no other uh, uh, intent in mind than that. Please, James. Uh, in a related vein. Of course. Wait, oh. just one thing. Um, this, after the, the last batch of, um, there were not, not emails from Secretary Clinton, but they were very much like the ones that um, uh, Arshad was just talking about between top aid, her, her, some of her top aides and, and Clinton Foundation folks. Um, <clears throat> one of your colleagues said that um, that you were, that the State Department was sure that there was no uh, impropriety involved in any of the contacts between this building and the foundation. Is that still the case? That is still uh, our uh, belief, uh, yes. So you, there was no impropriety that this was simply, uh, you know, uh, evidence of the way the process works and in, in that, uh, you know, uh, any Secretary of State has aides who are uh, getting emails or contacts by a broad range of, of, uh, of uh, individuals and, and organizations. So as far as you're concerned, what these emails, like the ones that just were released today, yeah. don't show anything new. This is old news. You guys have already looked into the or already looked into this and, and decided that there wasn't any problem? I mean, or of course, any... we're always assessing new emails as they come in, so I don't want to make it look like we just well, disregarded I mean, this. Are... I think that – I'm sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, I, no, I, go ahead and finish. No, I just said we'll always assess new emails as they come in, but we're – These aren't new emails. I understand they're... that. But, I mean, you guys, you're, you're confident or you know that the emails that were released today have been looked at by people whose job it is to look into these things and decide whether or not there was a – a, a violation or an appearance. Yes, that of is a, my understanding. The, yes, and 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 nothing. Again, I, I stand has, by what I just said, which is that there was nothing. Yeah. How, do you, how do you address the inference? Forgive me, James. No, the inference that is left in Judicial Watch's statements on this, that uh, meetings were granted to certain people who were also significant donors to or partners with uh, the Clinton Foundation. And they leave the inference that people were getting meetings or getting consideration at a minimum for meetings because they were big donors to the, the foundation. I mean, uh, I guess I, I would just uh, once again emphasize that um, There wasn't uh, a single channel uh, for access to uh, the Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Clinton. Um, and for senior aides uh, in the department at that time to have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to, 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 uh, to have connections with uh, the Clinton Foundation, which, by the way, was working on. Uh, for example, Haiti relief post-earthquake, a uh, pretty significant role in that, in fact, uh, only speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, these were uh, important people who had uh, reason to uh, convey information to the secretary. There was nothing uh, that we have seen that implied any kind of untoward relationship. But, but I, uh, my question goes yeah. really to the fun. I mean, it's clear in the American domestic political tradition, it is completely explicit. You pay X thousands of dollars and you get to go to a reception with the president or a candidate for the presidency. And, you know, I've been at fundraisers standing on the outside of them where there are different levels of money you cough up and that governs how much access you get and whether you get a photo with them or not and so on. And so the question I'm, I, I want you to address yeah. is, Judicial Watch is leaving this inference there that you pay to the foundation and you get to see the Secretary of State. Can you say, no, that's just not true, that's not how it works? What I would say is that we have no uh, uh, 
clear uh, sign that that was the case. We've seen no evidence that that was the case. Thank you. Yep. Please, I'm sorry, James, go ahead. Man. That's all right. Um, in a related vein, and I should say to Arshad that in fairness to Judicial Watch, I think their public relations people would be very displeased if the record were allowed to stand suggesting that they had simply left such such things uh, to to inference. They, they make it rather explicit how they feel about it. Um, I stand correct. <laughs> Fox News has obtained and shared with your office roughly 180 pages of call logs from the office of Cheryl Mills covering a two-year period when she was chief of staff to Secretary Clinton. As you have seen, the individual who left the greatest number of messages for Ms. Mills in that period of time by an exponential order was Laura Graham, then the chief operating officer for the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. close to 150 in the two-year time frame. As you know, this evidence arises at a time when many questions have been raised about whether the Clinton State Department, and specifically Ms. Mills, maintained an appropriate distance from the Clinton Foundation. Can you tell us why Ms. Graham and Ms. Mills were in such close and constant contact? Well, uh, a couple of uh, uh, things to say about this. First of all, um, just to step back and uh, um, address what uh, James is referring to, these are logs uh, uh, that were, in effect, spreadsheets uh, that were maintained by uh, wh who was then uh, an assistant to uh, Chief of Staff uh, Cheryl Mills uh, to track, uh, as you can imagine, the large volume of incoming calls that she received uh, about a range of issues. And um, uh, these documents were released through the FOIA process, uh, I think, back in April. Um, so it's no surprise, of course, as I just think I said to Arshad, that uh, State Department officials are, are in contact with a range uh, of outside individuals and organizations, including nonprofits, NGOs, and, of course, think tanks and, and others. Um, and that's certainly true with, uh, uh, with Ms. Mills. Uh, I would also state... Uh, and again, I don't know if I'm inferring from your, uh, from your question. I wouldn't want to do that. But uh, Secretary Clinton's ethics agreement at the time did not preclude other State Department officials from engaging with or having contact with the Clinton Foundation. Um, so you're right. There are these, uh, I guess, 100 and approximately 150 messages. Um, I, I can't give you a, a, a readout of every one of those messages or every one of those calls, rather. And in fact, how many of the calls were returned and, or connected? Um, all I can say, and I would go back to, again, what I just said, explained to our shot is, you know, I would note that the State Department at the time uh, was, and certainly uh, Cheryl Mills uh, uh, individually, was a, a coordinating hub uh, for U.S. and international efforts to uh, relief efforts in the wake of the uh, 2011 uh, Haiti earthquake. And as I said, uh, uh, Cheryl Mills uh, personally led those uh, efforts throughout her tenure here. Um, and former President Clinton also played uh, a role as a coordinator for relief efforts in his role as the U.S. Special Envoy, or U.N. Special Envoy for Haiti. Um, so uh, again, uh, I don't want to uh, speculate, but that could well be the reason why there were these calls, uh, simply uh, coordinating on what was uh, one of the uh, premier or most significant uh, foreign relations issues of the time. On one occasion, Ms. Graham left a message from Ms. Mills referencing, quote, our boss, unquote. Did Ms. Graham and Ms. Mills have the same boss? <laughs> I, I can't speculate as to who they were referring to. I just don't know. I didn't was. ask you to do that. I just asked, did they have the same boss? They did boss? not have the same boss. I can answer that. With these call logs fresh in mind, can you still assure the American people that the Clinton State Department maintained at all points an appropriate distance from the Clinton Foundation? Again, we have seen no evidence of any uh, behavior, any uh, relations with the Clinton Foundation that weren't completely above board. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's likely that uh, what they were dealing with uh, during many of these calls was the immediate aftermath of the uh, Haiti earthquake. And finally, since we just touched on Ms. Abedin, mm -hmm. uh, some unrelated questions about her. The New York Post has been reporting on the presence of Huma Abedin for more than a decade on the masthead 
of an Islamic journal that published some fairly vile things, including blaming the U.S. for 9-11, and an article by Ms. Abedin's mother in which she wrote that the, quote, empowerment of women does more harm than benefit, unquote. When Ms. Abedin was cleared to work here in the Department of State, one of the two jobs she held down during her tenure here, was Ms. Abedin's association with this journal known to the secretary or to anyone else in this building? Uh, James, I don't have an immediate answer for you on that. Uh, I've never, I haven't seen these reports, uh, to be honest. Um, what I would say is that we wouldn't normally talk about uh, someone's clearance process, except to say that uh, having gone through security clearance process and uh, 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 considering what she, the level of clearance she would have needed for uh, the job she, that she held, uh, I can assure you that she was, uh, like any individual, would be uh, fully vetted. Uh, but I can't speak to these uh, specific allegations. I just don't. The presence of a State Department employee or a prospective employee on the masthead of a, of a journal that is published and disseminated would typically be the kind of thing that those who do the vetting around here would, in fact, uncover, correct? Uh, again, I think they look at a broad range um, of, uh, of uh, material. Uh, they conduct extensive interviews with friends, families, and when they go to uh, those friends and families, they get in, uh, second and third uh, sources uh, uh, to talk about uh, what an individual's connections and others may be. But beyond that, I don't want to speak uh, in any great detail about how that process works. Can you take the question of whether Secretary Clinton knew about Huma Abedin's presence on the masthead of this journal for 12 years? I could certainly take it. I'm not sure I can get you a clear answer for that. For one thing, I don't know that we would speak on behalf of uh, Secretary Clinton, who now has left the State Department and is no longer here. And I'm, I'm just not, in all uh, uh, candor, uh, sure that I'm able to talk about uh, what was shared uh, about a, an employee's uh, uh, security clearance uh, might be of a confidential nature. So, And, and Matt Lee, earlier in his yep. questioning today, said he was questioning you on the subject of Iran, but really it seemed to be more about Syria. Uh, in the event that we come back to the subject of Iran in this briefing, I would appreciate a chance to uh, resume questioning with you on the subject of the video. You know, I the, the to video. that because the I video. wanted to ask that okay. question. Thank you. I, yeah, sure. I wanted to ask the follow-up okay. on that question on Iran. Of course, sir. We jumped into the email. We go back now to Iran and Syria. Are we not? He's saying I'm running a sloppy briefing, briefing, sir. Listen, I'm, I'm fine with any format. But are we sticking to sort of issue dedicated or not? You know, I'm, I'm okay with any format, but let's have something on. Thank you. Do you have a question? I have a question. I wanted to ask on, on Iran. Remember when you went to, to Rashad to talk about the emails? Can we go back to Iran there? I, I have a question on Iran. Mine is about the editing of the video. Right, no. it's not proper let's, let's take your question. Okay. That's why I'm no deferring. Worries. Yeah, no worries. Can I, can I ask you uh, some questions related to Thursday and Friday's uh, information regarding the $400 million payment? Okay. Um, so let's, let's unwind this a bit. Uh, on August 3rd, uh, spokesman Kirby said reports <coughs> of the link between the prisoners and this payment were completely false. Do you stand by that or no? Um, uh, yes, we do. So uh, I'm sorry. One more time. That what the, the statement. I apologize. All right. Well, no, I'm sorry. I was I was finding okay. my. Okay. Um, on August third, uh, John Kirby, the assistant secretary, uh, did a tweet, and it said, "Reports of a link between the prisoners and the payment are completely false." Do you stand by that? Yes, in the aspect that it was conveyed at the time through the, through the, now let me be clear, that the article that was written that conveyed that it was some kind of ransom or quid pro quo. And we've been very adamant about uh, defending that it was not uh, done in that manner. He didn't say reports of, he said reports of link was the quote, not reports of ransom regarding an aspect of something. Do you stand by that there was no link between these? Again, what we stand by is the fact that there was no ransom or quid pro quo. Okay, that's not what he said at the time. Uh, in the briefing, he said on Thursday that the money was used as leverage and there is a connection. He used the word connection. Uh, do you stand by that? Yes. Uh, today at the White House briefing, uh, Press Secretary Josh Ernest said he wouldn't have used the word leverage and he refused to use the word leverage. Do you understand why the White House isn't accepting your latest rationale for the money? Uh, 
First of all, I wouldn't, well, uh, look, uh, there's a lot of wordplay here, uh, perhaps on both our parts. Um, so what is clear about the way this uh, occurred, and we've tried to address this uh, uh, on a variety of occasions, on a number of occasions rather, um, and perhaps we haven't done a good enough job at it, but uh, we have tried to, if you will, pull back the veil on what happened. And what happened was uh, on that day, uh, in the final hours, uh, there was the culmination of three lines of effort, the Iran nuclear deal, the release of our detainees, and also on our side, the release of uh, Iranian uh, uh, prisoners uh, held in U.S. prisons, and then thirdly, the Hague uh, settlement. Uh, in the final hours, uh, minutes if you will, uh, there were uh, snags uh, in the process. It was not as smooth as one would always hope for. Uh, things happen. Uh, we've recognized that and we've talked about that. Uh, and in fact, what I strongly defend is what John said last week, which is it would have been imprudent for us to have handed over that money and not used it as leverage or however you, whatever type of description you want to give it, except for ransom. It was not ransom because this was money that we owed the Iranian government. But in those final moments, it was decided that we were certainly going to use it as leverage in that particular moment until our citizens were back on a plane and safely out of Iranian airspace. And again, we stand by that because that was important to, uh, uh, to get them safe home, safely home. Okay. I, I can accept that, but I, you probably should coordinate with the White House. You guys get on message on that. <laughs> Point taken. He, he went back in time again today. Um, since we're lifting the veil, as you said, uh, on Friday's conference call, a senior State Department official said he would provide details on how the $1.3 billion in subsequent payments were made. Um, can you provide any indication whether that was also cash, gold, silver, check, promissory note, blood diamonds? I, I don't know. You, you tell us what form that payment took place. Um, look, um, I, you know, um, I'm, obviously we've talked about this on, offline, rather. Um, you know, I'm trying my best to get more details about that. The problem that we're up against uh, with regard to this particular particular piece of the arrangement is that um, we generally don't talk about um, these kinds of financial arrangements because, uh, and especially in the case of Iran, uh, where we don't have uh, a, a financial relationship or a business relationship with them, uh, that other parties uh, may have been involved and we don't want to speak on their behalf. Um, without getting their uh, agreement to I'm do not so. I'm asking you for the interlocutor mm. for the other central Got bank it. that was used in that. I'm only asking for the form of payments. Okay. And maybe if you can on how it was spread out. Mm -hmm. That has nothing I, I to could do try to do that, that and I would also violate anyone's. Sure. I, I can. Uh, I can certainly try to get you that information, Brad. And I can also would uh, also encourage you to uh, talk to the Department of Treasury, which I also think handles you should that. Should be able to get a, an answer from Treasury faster than than I will. But but I'll. Hey, Mark. Sure. I just have one or two more. Okay, um, go ahead. You've been, uh, the administration's been very adamant that this was uh, done properly. I think in the conference call, the, the senior official said it was fairly above board, the $1.3 billion. Do you, back to the $400 million, do you know who picked up the money? I don't. I don't have the, uh, you're talking about from who, Iran. Do you from know Iran? Who, yeah, who, who'd you pay? I, I believe it was Iranian officials and Iranian government officials. I don't know particularly who individually it was. I Do you know from which part of the Iranian government you paid? I, I don't have that information, though. Does the administration know who it paid? I'm certain they would, yes. Okay, so that, that information is something you think should come out at some point if you're lifting the veil or, or no? Well, again, um, you know, there's, uh, we'll see what level of detail we can get for you. And then lastly, there's been, um, murmurs, well, more than murmurs, from Congress, uh, Senate and House Banking and some others that about a congressional inquiry. Is this something you think uh, is a worthy topic of congressional inquiry, given the slowness on a lot of the revelations? Well, um, given the what? I'm sorry. The slowness on the oh, details. The I mean, seven um, months later, we're still going into this. Again, um, well, 
look, we don't have to relitigate this. Uh, of course, we can, but uh, we don't have to. Um, but you know, we were very um, upfront uh, at the very beginning about the fact that all of these, all three of these efforts, uh, culminated at, at the same time back in January. Um, that said, uh, certainly, you know, we're always uh, looking to provide. Uh, uh, and cooperate with, uh, provide Congress with, and cooperate with Congress on any information it desires. So, so you you welcome a congressional investigation if one came. We will, we will do our best to cooperate with and uh, and uh, work with Congress. Right. Just on the just on this is very brief on the money. You said last minute snags. Does that mean that you're saying now that the the money the plane with the money was delayed? I, I, we're, we're saying we talked about this a little bit in, uh, last week. Yeah, last week. Yeah. In other words, there were there were these snags, and then you guys went and said, "Look, you're not going to get your money until these snags are." There right? were, um, and snags is my term, but yes, there was um, during the actual handover right, of the. Old, then I, and, and then yeah. just one more thing, you know, there, there have been Iranian officials, or at least one Iranian official, quoted as saying there was a ransom. There's a reason that they think that, um, uh, and. Or there's a there's an explanation for why they would want to say yes, that. Yes, exactly. Thank you. But my, I want to go back to 2011 when the hikers were released. Uh, at that time, there was You're uh, straining my memory, but uh, the bail, yeah. bail, quote unquote, paid of 500,000. Um, it says it, at the time, you guys said it was arranged by the Sultan of Oman. But I'm just wondering, was there any U.S. Government money involved in that that you gave to the Sultan of Oman, or did you just out of the kindness of his heart reach into his own bank account and pay that <coughs> bail money? Um, because, frankly, either way, that might be where the Iranians got the idea that they could hold Americans and get paid for it. Granted, not 400 million, but. Well, again. So. That the, the question sure. is, was there any American money involved in the payment of bail by the Sultan I'd have to of look Oman back at it, Matt. I, 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 I'll, in 2001? Yeah, I'll have to look at that. But again, I just want to, you know, raise again uh, my disagreement or, about how this $400 million is being bandied about as some kind of ransom or as some kind of money that we, out of whatever motivation, decided we were going to give the Iranians. This was part of a settlement that we owed the Iranian government. And right, by the way, American businesses it. and American companies have received similar compensation right, right. since know, I know, but then you said you held it up just now. You no, no, but that's right. But, I, but that so, safe, no, right? no, so, so, so again, just to clarify, uh, what John had spoken to last week and what Brad referred to was the fact that, uh, you know, when, um, there were some delays and some, uh, frankly, lack of clarity in what was happening on the ground as uh, we were getting all of these uh, uh, American detainees on and their family uh, on a plane to get out of there. We said we acknowledged that, yes, we did use it as leverage. Can I go to the rockets, please? Can I ask about the rockets? Stay, let's finish this and I'll get to you, Said I'm not ignoring you, I swear. Just to follow up on Mr. Clapper's line of questioning, Chairman Royce of the House Foreign Affairs Committee told Fox News on Thursday that the $400 million went to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps without knowing necessarily the exact destination within the Iranian government of that money, as you seem uh, unsure right now, can you at least rule out that the money went to the IRGC? Uh, all I would say, James, is I just don't have that level of detail. I just don't know it. Personally, I can check. Please. I want to go to the Rockets, but how would you know if the money went to the, the, IRGC? the Revolutionary Guard? I mean, honestly, uh, I mean, no we, we could always hand it over no to someone who would hand it over to the IRGC. I mean, it's their. Right. Okay. Okay. I mean, what? Okay. All right. I want to ask about the rock. You're not even saying who you handed it over to. Don't you care? I mean, you would want to know, don't you? I'm you saying I personally there? don't know that level of detail. I'm I mean, certain that uh, the people who we dealt with or who dealt with this knew who they were handing over the money. Okay. I want to go Can you rule out that the Revolutionary Guard picked up the money? I said I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And on the S300. Now, there were statements from Iran saying that they have it. They have the, the, the Russian uh, missiles that were, I guess, stopped back in 2010 because of the sanctions. First of all, um, did you confirm that in your response to Matt? Did you confirm that they do have most of these uh, rockets, most of the I missiles? did not confirm that. Okay. Now, let me ask you about the um, things called Barab <coughs> 373 
is that it is a rocket that Iran claims it has made on its own and in using its own technology, its own resources, right. and so on. Do you have a position on that? Would you, do you object to Iran having this kind of missile? I don't. We're aware. Yeah, no, we've. Anyway. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you yeah. off. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about this uh, news reports of there's some kind of domestic uh, yeah. missile the, defense, the, yeah, the domestically built. The country was I, I don't. We're, we're looking into the reports. Um, uh, you know, and uh, I'd really refer you to the Department of Defense to talk about. Okay. But is that something that would, would bother you if Iran developed its own uh, defenses or its own rockets and so on? Because they also are doing making or designing or manufacturing cruise missiles and – Well, again, and I think – I, I think, I, I, I think therein lies the – you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, the issue here would be whether it is an offensive or defensive capability. Okay. And, and one, one, one last question on uh, the role of uh, Iran uh, uh, in Yemen. Do you, are you okay. concerned that these rockets may find their way to, let's say, the, the Houthis in Yemen? Well, uh, you know, certainly we're always concerned about any uh, influence that would uh, further uh, <coughs> uh, exacerbate uh, the conflict in Yemen. Uh, what we're trying to push for now and indeed is what the Secretary is trying to do in his meetings later this week in Saudi Arabia is uh, work on how do we get back in place uh, a, a, a credible peace process in Yemen. <coughs> let's do, let's finish all the Iran stuff. Let's do that, second. and then I swear I'll get to you. Are you on Iran or no? Turkey. I swear I'll get to you. I don't leave. I had a hunch. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I, I apologize, uh, Arshad. I'm not sure I have it all listed uh, in front of me. Let me just check very quickly, and I'll get to you, James, I promise. Okay. What are we reading out right now? Uh, who he's meeting with, in, um, and I don't think I have it in here, but I'll, let me just okay. check. Let it me will just be in Saudi Arabia, and it, part, it will be at least in part to advance the m peace process. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> Sir. Okay, thank you. During his briefing on Thursday, when he presented the findings of the Office of the Legal Advisor on the edited briefing video, Admiral Kirby recounted the fateful moment back in December 2013 when a female supervisor within the Bureau of Public Affairs placed a telephone call to a subordinate, a subordinate technician uh, within the Bureau and asked for this infamous edit of the video to be made. Kirby stated, and I quote, there is no evidence to indicate who might have placed that call or why. Do you stand by that statement? Yes. The legal advisor's report, which was made available to the news media only after Kirby's briefing had concluded, included a section that is captioned, evidence of purposeful editing, does it not? Yes, but I believe your statement again, sorry, I'm just rewinding here, said that we don't know who that person was. Correct. It said, there is no evidence to indicate <laughs> Mr. Kirby said, there is no evidence to indicate who might have placed that call or why, and you just stood by that statement. In the section of the report that I just mentioned, mm. it states, and I quote, the technician did not recall a reason being given for the edit request, but did believe that the requester had mentioned in the course of the call a Fox Network reporter and Iran, unquote. Uh, that suggests that the exchange between Ms. Saki and me was, in fact, directly related to why the call was placed. I'm not sure it does. I think it actually would just mark where it was identifiable, and that's a common thing. Look, I mean, I'm speculating here, and I think that's the important part to stress here. It could easily have been someone conveying to someone, hey, that's where you find this exchange. It's where the Fox News reporter, everyone knows, of course, uh, your famous visage, um, would uh, be a place to find that part of the transcript and identify that as a part where there was maybe a garble, uh, maybe a glitch. The fact is we don't know. And I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm not trying to be lighthearted about this. We did conduct an investigation. We conducted over 30 interviews. We looked at the email records. We could. You know, we did an honest appraisal of what we uh, could do uh, in terms of finding out what happened here and we didn't find out, we didn't find a smoking gun. When Admiral, when Admiral Kirby stated that there was, quote, no evidence to indicate why this call was placed, that was false, wasn't it? There was some evidence. And in fact, the mention of me and Iran appears in a section of the report entitled Evidence of Purposeful Editing. So there was not no evidence, was there? 
again, it, it's... There was some evidence of, about what the call I mean, was we all... To. Well, look, James, we all know, and, and that's partly what I, why I made my last point. Look, we all know that it was the segment in which you asked this question of Jen Psaki that was edited from uh, this video, which was not, as we have said many times, the official transcript, but was a video of this press conference. Video that was always available through other means, but this particular video was edited and that segment was edited. What John was trying to convey, what the report we believe conveyed, or found rather, was that there's no smoking gun here. There's no clear indication that this was done uh, with malicious intent. He said no evidence. He didn't say clear evidence one way or the other. The point is, this person recalls the request of the edit, citing that exchange. So we can't rule out that that was, in fact, the basis for the request, correct? I, I think we can't rule in or out anything. Okay. During Thursday's briefing, Admiral, Admiral Kirby acknowledged it to be true that the State Department videos of its briefings are shot with cameras purchased with taxpayer funds, and that the employees operating these cameras are themselves federal employees, That's correct. as are those who upload the videos to the State Department website and maintain that website. And you don't disagree with any of that, correct? Correct? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> when the technicians I think operate... I set up again here, Brad. <laughs> Again, with Panam. <laughs> when the technicians operate the camera for this purpose, as they are at this very moment, they are, in fact, recording the briefing, are they not? Yes. So would it be safe to say that every time State Department employees shoot the video of these briefings, they are, in fact, making an audio-visual record of the briefing? Isn't that what the video is? It is. Um, and one of the things we talked about last week was, you know, the fact that, uh, look, the printed transcript. It's a simple descended. question. It's an audiovisual record of the briefing. It is correct. an audiovisual record, right. not necessarily the official audiovisual record. Of well, wait a the minute. It's, it, it is generated by federal employees of this federal agency with federal equipment. And that would make it the official audiovisual record, would it not? Not necessarily. I mean, we put, uh, well, don't look aghast. Um, no, there are different. I was looking at scans. A scans. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I mean, in all, in all seriousness, you know, this is, we, we've talked about this last week, and in fact, it's mentioned in the report is, you know, and we're in the process of consulting with the National Archives and Record Administration um, on, you know, what constitutes official records and transcripts from the Public Affairs Bureau of the State Department. It has always been clear understanding that the written transcript uh, that comes out, it is uh, sent far and near every day uh, is the official transcript of the State Department. Now, let me just finish. Now, the video transcript uh, of this uh, briefing was it's offered. Not a transcript, it is a video. Rather, a video of the, the briefing, thank you, uh, that was put up on various uh, <coughs> platforms. Uh, was frankly first done as a, as a courtesy, as also as a way to get the video out uh, to different audiences, to other audiences uh, that might not necessarily be on the mailing list of the State Department or want a printed transcript of the briefing. Um, we also, as I said, that same uh, video was put up on divots, or a different version of it, but put up on divots that was unedited. I'm just saying that it was not the uh, official video or official transcript of that said briefing. We know it wasn't the official transcript. The transcript was the official transcript. Correctly. Um, I think, Mark, that you know perfectly well that whether we're speaking in colloquially or strict technical terms, you are engaged in an elaborate kabuki with other angels on the head of a pin when you seek to tell us that the official video of the State Department's briefings prepared by State Department employees is not the official video or may not be considered the official video. The unofficial videos of these briefings are the ones that the news organizations take. You know this. The official video is the one that your department creates. But be that as it may, um, my final question on this is to try I'll to give some, <laughs> some help to you uh, sure. in your discussions with uh, the National Archives and Records Administration. The Federal Records Act defines presidential records as, quote, audio and visual records or other mechanical recordations, whether in analog, digital, or any other form, unquote, and encompasses any such records generated by, quote, a unit or individual of the executive office of the president whose function is to advise or assist the president in his official duties. Uh, given that you, from this podium, in this very briefing, have just acknowledged that the State Department videos created and maintained with State Department and funds and employees 
uh, are in fact uh, an audiovisual record of these proceedings, uh, then why wouldn't we imagine that uh, they are covered under the Federal Records Act, which again specifies audio and visual records? All I can say uh, in answer is uh, that the National Archives and Record Administration, who we're consulting with uh, to see whether any changes should be made uh, to address press briefing videos, <coughs> clearly recognizes through its current disposition system, or schedule rather, that the written transcript is the quote unquote permanent record uh, with regard to the briefing. Now, all that said, what's important here is that we acknowledged that there was a portion of a video of that briefing on that day that was edited. We have acknowledged that that is, for whatever reason it was done, uh, was incorrect and should not have been done. We've taken steps to address that. At the same time, it's also important to recognize that if this was part of some uh, grand scheme to somehow blot that from the record of history, it was a poorly executed one uh, because there were plenty of other sources, including news reports that came out of that exchange. So let me just finish. All we're trying to say here is that, uh, is that uh, there were other sources out there of this uh, briefing, of this exchange within the briefing, and that uh, we acknowledge that this edit, deliberate or otherwise, to this particular video. Well, we know it was deliberate. Sorry, let me correct myself. Uh, we don't know why it was done that that edit should not have been done. And we've now put in place a policy that will forbid that from happening or uh, keep, prevent that from happening in the future. I agree with you. It wasn't a great advertisement for the efficacy of government. Let me finish by simply asking you, because both you and Admiral Kirby have raised this question, this notion that these videos are only made and uploaded to the State Department website as a courtesy. Is it the posture of the department that uh, only records that are generated as a result of some statutory obligation should be counted as federal records? Or, be, or those records that are generated as a courtesy or from some other human motivation um, aren't necessarily to be considered federal records? In other words, it strikes me that this reference to the courtesy, the great courtesy you show the American sure. people um, in, in recording and, and archiving these briefings that that's irrelevant to the question of whether or not it's a federal record, and can we agree about that? Well, while we're having this discussion, I would uh, call your attention to the fact that we are one of the few federal agencies who gets up on a daily basis and holds these kind of press briefings and exhausts the rooms answering all of your questions. Uh, we may not be able to give you all of the information that you want every day that you seek, but we make a best effort every day to answer every question from every person in this room who comes in there who has a question about the conduct or the content of our foreign policy, and, uh, and uh, I'm proud of that, personally and professionally. Now, with regard to whether this is the should be considered an official transcript, I'm only citing a chapter record. of a federal record, thank you. Um, uh, I can't speak to that uh, in terms of whether <coughs> that we should have that, uh, well, that semantic <laughs> argument. The presence of courtesy is not a, excuse I agree. Me, the presence of courtesy is not determinative as to whether something is a federal record. Am I correct about that? Uh, again, Since you keep raising it. Well, I keep raising the fact that there were other records out there, one of which was considered the permanent record. Let's leave it there. Please. Okay. Kurdish President Masoud Barzani will be meeting with Vice President Biden in Turkey. Can you tell us, can you inform us what will be on the agenda of their talks? Uh, I cannot, and I'm sorry you, know, you waited so long for that question. Um, uh, uh, no, I mean, look, I, I'd have to refer you to the White House. Okay, possibly then, since you can't tell me very much, so I'd love to guess. I think the past decade has quite arguably vindicated the Vice President's judgment about Iraq when he wrote in the pages of the New York Times that Iraq should be decentralized into three separate regions. One can say that seems to be a keen insight. At the time, the Sunnis opposed it, but I bet you that they've got a different attitude now. Do you think it's possible, if you could speculate, that that spirit of decentralization might be informing Vice President, President Biden's meeting with Mr. Barzani? I would in no way whatsoever speculate in that regard. Syria. 
Please. Thank you. So, um, Jeff Davis, the a spokesperson for the Pentagon, said this uh, over the weekend about the regime airstrikes on Hasaka in Syria. He said, quote, as we've said in the past, the Syrian regime would be well advised not to interfere with coalition forces or our partners. So uh, the Kurdish YPG forces have been described from this podium as partners and as brave. Secretary Carter has described the YPG as willing, capable, and one of the most effective partners. Now the Pentagon has confirmed that the YPG has come under attack. What does well advised mean? And as uh, Jeff Davis notes, you've warned the regime in the past, as, as he says, as we've said in the past. Why haven't we seen any response to Syrian regime airstrikes on the YPG forces? Who are your partners? Uh, well, I'm going to refer you to uh, the Department of Defense uh, to speak to uh, their comments uh, regarding uh, airstrikes uh, that they might undertake. Uh, but uh, what I think was conveyed was uh, the fact that, uh, and we have acknowledged this, that we have uh, special operating forces, SOF, uh, who are advising and assisting uh, some of the uh, uh, forces that are fighting ISIL in uh, northern Syria. And uh, what was made very clear uh, was uh, if we believe that these uh, uh, personnel, these people, are put in harm's way by these airstrikes, we'll uh, act accordingly. Not just them. Jeff Davis says coalition forces or our partners. This is quote unquote. So meaning that if your partners, as I said, the YPG has been described as your partner, comes under attack, the Syrian regime will be well advised not to do that. I mean, why to issue warnings when not to follow through? When you don't, I mean, why should the Syrian regime take the United States seriously every time you issue a, a threat and you don't really implement it? Well, again, the first priority is always the safety of our own personnel. Um, you know, we're, we are aware that uh, the Syrian regime has maintained this base in Hasaka uh, since before the start of our operations there, our uh, cooperation with the, the uh, Syrian forces, uh, Syrian Arab forces that are fighting ISIL. Um, our forces and our focus is on the counter ISIL efforts uh, in northern Syria. Uh, we are assisting the Sy Syrian Democratic Forces uh, in that regard. Um, and uh, as you note, uh, as a result of some of these regime airstrikes, uh, U.S. aircraft went into that area to ensure the safety of our personnel. Um, we're going to continue to maintain very close situational awareness uh, and we'll always come to the defense, as I just said, of our personnel. Uh, we communicated that to the Russians uh, through our deconfliction channel uh, to reinforce the, main, uh, the, the importance of maintaining uh, separation and safety of flight for uh, any of our operations. Um, but uh, Last week, we saw regime airstrikes came very dangerously close to U.S. forces on the ground. Uh, but in terms of uh, any other comments they may have made, I've just referred you to uh, Department of Defense. Sure thing. Um, so, in effect, if there are U.S. – wherever there are U.S. personnel, there's – in a in, in a pretty wide area of northern Syria, because that encounter you talked about, they hadn't necessarily <clears throat> struck or dropped bombs. So, in effect, there's a no-fly zone in that part of – in Syria where U.S. personnel are, the de facto one? No, I wouldn't say that at all, because that requires – in terms of logistics and support and uh, footprint and uh, uh, execution is at a whole different level. What, uh, what I would say is that um, any time – and we're watching and monitoring closely where our forces – and it's a relatively small number of forces, so let's not exaggerate here – uh, uh, are on the ground advising and assisting these Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, uh, and we see airstrikes uh, appear to uh, – or not appear to, but carried out in close proximity to them, uh, then we're certainly going to uh, 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 come to their defense. And we're certainly going to make clear to uh, the Russians and the regime uh, that uh, we'll protect our forces. Well, I understand that, but just – But, I mean, you said de facto uh, no-fly zone, and I, I, 
again, I would refer you to the Pentagon, but there's, I think there's a distinction between the two. I agree, I guess, but if, if they don't drop their bombs, you're saying if they committed these airstrikes, I understand that they would fly to intercept, but in the reports of what happened most recently, they hadn't struck yet. They were just flying in the area. So, I mean, does the U.S. feel that any presence of the Syrian Air Force in areas where the United States is or might have forces is unpermissible or prohibited? No, I think what we saw last week were indeed airstrikes carried out by the regime, uh, 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 at least to my understanding. And uh, we very quickly and urgently conveyed that, uh, you know, if we see additional ones, we'll act accordingly. Mark, you conveyed to the Syrian government where your trainers or personnel are? No. Um, I mean, only in the case, in this case, where, you know, we had to acknowledge, I, I think, you that they were in close proximity. On, on the humanitarian situation, because there was a of session today of the, the Secu National Security, I mean, <coughs> National Security, the Security Council of the UN. They were meeting, they were being briefed by Stephen O'Brien, I believe, on the situation. My question to you, are you uh, going to go along with Russia's suggestion for uh, or call for 48-hour uh, ceasefires, or do you have any other any uh, any, um, any view on, no, no. on the issue of you know, safe passages that was suggested yeah. by Russia? Well, is it adequate? Not really. Um, but you know, would we go along with it? Sure, because frankly, any uh, effort to stop the violence and allow some humanitarian assistance to release uh, to relieve the besieged citizens of Aleppo would be welcome. But it's not sufficient. It's not what Russia uh, had signed up to uh, in UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2254, but also additionally uh, through various meetings of the ISSG that it would provide uh, full access to humanitarian, uh, to besieged areas uh, for humanitarian assistance. So it's not uh, in any way uh, adequate uh, to the need that is out there, but uh, certainly. Uh, the sooner the better we can get some relief to these uh, people. So would you support these corridors suggested by Russia for people to leave and come back and for goods and whatever, you know, humanitarian aid to, to come through? I mean, again, you know, uh, uh, it's a hard answer to, to, it's a hard question to answer directly because um, it's insufficient. And in fact, what needs to take place is uh, more broadly is, you know, a nationwide cessation of hostilities. Uh, and until we get there, none of these half measures will be adequate. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, certainly if it, you're talking about innocent civilians being allowed to escape from a besieged city, you know, we're certainly not going to turn a blind eye to that. Please. Philippines. Philippines. A few questions. Are we done? I'm sorry. Let me just. Are we, uh, I'm sorry, because I got accused of not finishing out a, an issue. So are we done with Syria? <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> so good. Philippines. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte lashed out at the U.S. and the U.N. for criticizing his crackdown on suspected drug dealers or rather for <laughs> criticizing his country's methods. He threatened to leave the U.N. He accused the U.N the U.S. of violating human rights, citing police killings of black people. This comes two weeks after he insulted the U.S. ambassador to the Philippines, also called Secretary Kerry crazy. Do you see this as a, do you see this as a departure from normal relations? Or is this normal? Um, look, um, so first of all, I'll take your question step by step. I mean, we're very concerned, deeply concerned, I would say, about reports of extrajudicial killings uh, of individuals suspected to have been involved in uh, drug activity in the Philippines. Um, President Duterte's criticism of the U.S. aside, uh, I would uh, defend the fact that we are a nation who believes strongly in the role of law, in due process, and respect for human rights. Uh, that's not to say we're perfect, uh, but we believe in those ideals. And we also believe that those principles go a long way into promoting long-term uh, security. Uh, so we continue to work with and to urge uh, the Philippines uh, to ensure its law enforcement efforts comply with its human rights obligations. As to its comments about the UN, uh, look, I have to refer you to the President or his aides to explain what he meant. Um, it's not for us to parse uh, 
what he may have intended to say there. Um, not, you, you don't see it as a departure from normal relations, would you? Would you well, look, I, I mean, we were in the Philippines in Manila, uh, and we had a meeting with President Duterte uh, now several weeks ago. Um, but I can say that, you know, those meetings were held in a very constructive fashion. Uh, there was a good and frank exchange uh, on both sides uh, about the importance of the bilateral relationship with the Philippines on our part uh, and the desire to see it strengthened going forward. A recognition, I think, of some of the challenges that the Philippines uh, faces in terms of crime and in terms of drug trafficking, uh, but also on the part of the Secretary, Secretary of State uh, Kerry, a very clear message that law enforcement, effective law enforcement, has to be tied to uh, human rights concerns and respect for human rights, uh, and uh, and certainly, uh, you know, he conveyed that message in his meetings with the President. Uh, you you uh, said we were in Manila a few weeks ago. Was it Secretary Kerry's meeting? Are you referring to Secretary Kerry's no. meeting with the? Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Secretary Kerry was in Manila uh, uh, a few so, weeks so, ago. So, um, President Rodrigo Duterte uh, actually commented on that on that meeting, and 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 he said, and I quote here. Kerry came here, we had a meal, and he left me and Delphine, meaning the incoming defense uh, minister, I guess, $33 million. I said, okay, maybe we should offend them more, so this crazy <laughs> will just give more money just to make peace. So it's all about the money, end quote. Uh, is, this, is this normal for a bilateral relationship? Again, you're uh, asking me, um, which I think is out of my wheelhouse, to uh, defend uh, the comments of a uh, president of another country. Oh, no. I'm um, asking you to defend them. And what are you asking what, me? What is the reaction? Uh, the reaction is that, you know, we uh, continue to uh, make clear to the <coughs> Philippine government uh, about our concerns uh, about uh, human rights, uh, extrajudicial killings, um, but we're also committed to uh, our bilateral relationship and strengthening that bilateral relationship. A week ago, Secretary Carter announced ramped up military presence in the Philippines. Is the U.S. inclined to ignore the insults because uh, of the importance of the cooperation with the Philippines and of its position on the South China Sea? Uh, so a couple of thoughts. First of all is that we have a long uh, and enduring uh, security relationship with the Philippines. Uh, and of course we're seeking always to improve that relationship. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily tie that in with uh, anything else other than what it is, which is, uh, you know, uh, the Philippines remains an important partner uh, in the region. Um, with regard to uh, us looking uh, or uh, turning a blind eye to human rights abuse, uh, abuses or possible human rights abuses in the Philippines. I can assure you that that's not the case. Uh, we take any credible allegations of human rights uh, violations very, very seriously and uh, would raise them with the Filipino government. Um, can your reserved reaction to the insults and accusations be explained by the fact that the cooperation with the Philippines is important to the United States? and it doesn't want to sort of rock the boat you know, further. Look, I mean, we have a very frank and, and candid relationship with the Philippines, um, uh, but a good relationship with the Philippines. Uh, they're under a new leadership now with President Duterte. He is well known, as we all know in this room, as a, uh, a plain speaking, I guess, uh, politician. Uh, it's not for me to, uh, to judge that. Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, we continue to work with uh, the Filipino government uh, on a broad range of uh, bilateral and regional issues, and uh, while at the same time making clear that, uh, you know, uh, as Philippines addresses uh, issues that touch on human rights, that uh, we're going to make uh, our concerns clear. My very last one. My very last yes, one. Going. The Philippines president bringing up shootings involving police and black people in the U.S. and elevating it to an international level. Do you think it is appropriate for him to do that? 
I would say it's appropriate for any uh, one anywhere to uh, ask questions or look at. Uh, again, we're a transparent, I hope, uh, country. Uh, and as I said earlier, to your in response to your previous question, uh, we're by no means uh, perfect, uh, but we strive to have in place a justice system uh, that is uh, treats all people with respect and uh, and uh, respects their human rights. Please. Thank you, Mark. Uh, on North Korea, uh, yep. North Korean uh, Foreign Minister Lee Young will visit to New York next month for the UN uh, General Assembly. There is uh, uh, no diplomatic relationship between U.S. and North Korea. Uh, what is the, his uh, visa status of uh, entering the United States? What is the visa status yeah. of the foreign minister of? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear the first. Korean foreign minister visited to United States in New York. We don't normally months. discuss visa issues. Yeah. Um, what what, what I would say is, is sorry. What I would say is, with respect to the UN General Assembly and the UN writ large, is that um, uh, we have certain legal obligations that we adhere to uh, as a host country of the United Nations. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to that uh, often will uh, require us to allow uh, individuals of countries where we may not have, with whom we may not have uh, diplomatic relations to come uh, for the express purpose of attending uh, the General Assembly. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to specific individuals or cases. But the, the, he's entering the United States, but the, you know, so who gives to visa? To, to, to state I said country. I can't, I, I tried to explain this. We have certain legal obligations that we uh, have taken on as the host country for the United Nations uh, that allow us or permit us or require us to uh, provide visas for individuals from governments with whom we may not have diplomatic relations. Um, but I'm not going to talk about specific cases. One follow-up on the Clinton email. Um, looking at the Judicial Watch release today um, that is saying that there's you said there's no impropriety in the relationship between Hillary Clinton and the Clinton yeah. Foundation during that time. Um, is the argument that you're making is that uh, Crown Prince Salman and other people that are singled out in, in some of these emails would have access to the State Department and to Hillary Clinton irrelevant of their donations to the Clinton Foundation? Uh, Yes, I mean I can't. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm processing your question. I apologize for the delayed response there, um, because I'm processing the question. All I'm saying is that we, the State Department, uh, have contact with a wide range of individuals, of governments, with governments, with organizations, with uh, uh, NGOs uh, around the world, uh, and so we get requests for meetings or time with the secretary or access to the secretary from a variety of sources. All I'm saying in this case is that uh, no one below the secretary was prohibited from having uh, uh, relations with the Clinton Foundation at that time. So it's not surprising or necessarily does it uh, indicate something nefarious uh, was going on that, uh, that we were receiving messages uh, or getting uh, input from Clinton Foundation as to who this person might meet with. So it would not be unusual for, say, the, a member of the Saudi family to have access to uh, the Secretary of State for a meeting or, or? Well, again, it depends on what the issue was, what the subject matter, what the, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to just categorically say yes or no. Sorry. Please, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Really Can we just do one or two more questions? Uh -huh. I've been up here a long time. So a case of sedition has been registered against uh, Amnesty International in India after this stage an event called Broken Families and the situation of different families in India and Kashmir. So do you have anything to say to Amnesty or to Indian authorities on this? You're, you're saying, uh, one more time, I apologize, so Amnesty... A case of sedition against uh, Amnesty International in India. Um, with, against Amnesty International, I'm sorry. Um, well, uh, we obviously, as we do around the world, support the right to freedom of expression and assembly, including through civil society. Uh, we've seen these reports that local police in Bangalore, Bangalore have initiated a preliminary investigation and allegations of sedition against the Amnesty International. I direct you to the Bangalore P police uh, for more details into this investigation. Uh, but uh, certainly we, uh, as I said, respect the right for uh, uh, 
Amnesty and others to uh, express themselves freely. Pakistani and Indian authorities have expressed their desire to restart the dialogue process, but both the countries have their own agendas. Pakistan wants to talk about the Kashmir, while India wants to talk about the cross-border terrorism. So Pakistan, on different occasions, uh, seek U.S. role for mediation between the two countries. Will United States come forward uh, as a mediator? Well, first of all, we strongly support all efforts between India and Pakistan to uh, that can contribute to a more stable uh, and prosperous region. Uh, and that includes meetings at any level between Indian and Pakistani officials. Uh, our longstanding position has always been that India and Pakistan stand to benefit from a normalization of relations and practical cooperation. And so we would be encouraged uh, uh, that India and Pakistan continue to engage in direct dialogue aimed at reducing tensions. So I'm going to get to No, please. Um, one more. Uh, one more to China. Um, no, go ahead, sir. Yeah, and then China yeah, issued new guidelines on Sunday that aim at establishing a stronger Communist Party presence in all NGOs in China. Do you have any uh, comment on that? I believe I do. Talking about the charity law, I believe. Um, look, a vibrant civil society is. Uh, important to uh, development of any country around the globe, and we urge China to uphold uh, the assurances it has given that it will welcome and foster engagement with civil society uh, uh, and uh, engagement with civil society, including an active role for non-governmental organizations from other countries. And you had one more. Yes, on North Korea. Sure, go ahead. Um, so the, I know there's a big U.S.-Korea exercise taking place starting today, 25,000 U.S. troops. Um, North Korea's rhetoric is kind of ramped up, and, and the president of South Korea today was referencing it, um, saying that North Korea is planning a – is prepared for a preemptive Korea-style nuclear strike um, in case uh, the exercise poses a threat to them. Is there any – I know – this, this building doesn't comment too regularly on the rhetoric out of North Korea, but is there any concern? I mean, a year ago they shelled South Korea during the same period. Is there any concern that North Korea might take action then? Well, um, again, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense to talk about our military cooperation exercises, but, you know, to speak broadly to your question, is there any concern um, given the level of erratic behavior that we've seen on the part of – on behalf of North Korea over the past – certainly the past six or seven months? Uh, there's always concern, but uh, I don't think it's going to uh, keep us from moving forward. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.